So here's a moment that few people would imagine happening to their business. It's March 2013, and a man named Edgar Diaz is looking at what's left of his factory. It's a charred, smoking ruin. Edgar runs a dairy company. The fire started early that morning, and he's standing there in an industrial area on the outskirts of Dallas, just watching the smoldering building. Something that's usually a metaphor is actually happening to Edgar. The thing he built, threw his life into, it just went up in flames. From Gimlet, this is Startup. I'm Lisa Chow. There are a lot of different things that can take down a business. Customers won't buy what you're selling. Banks won't lend you money. You can get priced out by the competition. The thing that destroyed Edgar Diaz's company? There's a simple answer and a complicated one. Dan Charles is an NPR correspondent who covers food and agriculture, and he introduced us to this story. He's been following Edgar for the last year. In today's show, Dan shows us how Edgar got to this point, a journey that involves kidnapping, prison, and the cutthroat business of making yogurt. The path to that moment, Edgar Diaz looking at his burned-out yogurt factory in Texas, it's been a long one. And it started in an entirely different place, in Colombia, in the city of Medellin. That is where Edgar met Diana Ocampo. They married and started a small business together more than 20 years ago. They had both studied animal science at the university in Medellin. Dairy science, too, how to turn milk into cheese and yogurt. And that became their business. They'd drive all over the countryside outside of Medellin, buying milk from farmers. They'd take it back to their own farm and turn it into cream, fresh cheeses, dulce de leche. Diana and Edgar say those were good times. When you go to the little farms and you found this guy milking the cow, and they wake up at 3 a.m. to do that, and you get that milk, it's, it's like a magic. You get that milk, you bring it to your own plant, and then you process that milk and you make this cheese and then you give it to someone and they enjoy and that face they have when they, oh my God, this is so good, how you make it? That makes you feel so good. This is probably the best time in my life. We're working so hard, but you never feel tired. Our day started around 3 a.m. in the morning when the trucks go out. And after this, we go to the country and visit the producers. When you do this, when you can see the people dream. See the people dream, Edgar says. He talks about one of the farmers, a woman who had two cows. Now that she was selling some of the milk, she was hoping to get two more. Edgar and Diana's first customer owned a handful of cafes around Medellin. Word spread, and soon other cafes were lining up to buy their cream, their cheese, their yogurt, then some schools. They hired a few people to keep up with demand. It was exciting, but what Edgar loved most was the craft, the knowledge, the way bacteria, time, and temperature turn milk into cheese and yogurt. You have to know, oh, I have good bacteria, I have bad bacteria. What are they good doing? What is the bad doing? For me, the yogurt is everything. So Edgar and Diana were living their dream 20 years ago, meeting farmers, collecting milk, selling cheese, at its peak, Edgar says they had 25 employees and were grossing $30,000 a month. That's when the warnings started. Phone calls from the FARC, a guerrilla movement in the hills. Originally, it was dedicated to Marxist ideals. But by this time, the year 2000, it was acting more like an organized crime operation, demanding protection money. And I should say, the story that Deanna and Edgar tell, it's difficult to confirm it. But journalists who cover Colombia say shakedowns and harassment like this were common at that time, and there often are no records of it. Edgar says the FARC wanted a lot of cash, regular payments of $25,000. He didn't have that much. So instead, he tried to outwit the guerrillas. He hid from them, changed cars. But he says he didn't tell Diana. He felt like he should take care of this by himself. And one day, the guerrilla stopped his car as he was going out to visit farmers. Some people arrive. They say, Edgar. And I turn around and say, yeah. It's, it's, it's this kid with the machine guns. And they jump in and I say, okay, let's go. I say, what? Let's go. Where? With the guns, you know you lose. You, you can run and you can do anything. Diana got a call from co-workers who were with Edgar. Do you remember that day? 
Yeah, I was. Um, I didn't tell anyone in my family that happens. Diana says she was at a birthday party when the call came. And I say, oh, okay, okay, oh, oh, say, okay, I see, okay, okay, bye. I just hang up. And who call you? Oh, no one. And I just keep clapping and singing happy birthday to you. And then, and then I go home. She felt like she had to keep this thing quiet. She didn't want her family to worry. The gorillas demanded money. She told them she didn't have it. She waited. These days, Edgar says he doesn't want to talk about the details of his captivity. A few years ago, though, he told a reporter that the gorillas walked him blindfolded through the forest, beat him, and chained him to a tree at night. After a week or so, the Colombian police attacked the group of gorillas that was holding Edgar hostage and set him free. Edgar says the police told him to leave immediately if he could. So he caught a flight to Miami before he even saw his family again. He wasn't sure when or where he'd be reunited with them. After he fled, the gorillas came around again, this time looking for Edgar and Diana's four-year-old daughter, Alejandra. They stopped the school bus. The gorillas stopped yeah. the bus. Yeah, and they were looking for Alejandra. But on that day, Alejandra wasn't on the bus. She'd been sick. She was dehydrated. Diana had taken her to a hospital. And my sister went to my house and took my passport, and she packed like gym bag <laughs> with a uh, Barney, <laughs> the Alejandra's favorite toy, some clothes for her, just one clothes for me, and my passport, that's it. I never come back. I never went to my house. I never see anything. She and Alejandra caught a flight to Miami to meet Edgar. Over the next few months, Deanna's sister sold off some of the farm equipment. A lot of it she gave away. And that was the end of their first business. Edgar and Deanna applied for asylum in the United States. A year later, in 2002, they got it and started over in Dallas. Back in Colombia, they'd lived a comfortable middle-class life. Now, Deanna was cleaning houses. Edgar was working at Wendy's. For a while, he was buying and selling used cars. Both of them were struggling to learn English. Edgar got back into the dairy business for a while. He helped a farmer launch a line of cheeses. But that partnership broke apart. Edgar was at loose ends, not sure what to do. Then a friend came to talk, a guy named Juan Padilla, someone he'd met at church. He'd also seen his work at that cheese company. And he asked me, what are you doing? Why you don't start it again? I say, you know, Juan, the male business is no easy. The male business is like a, you have a uh, lover. You always spend money and money and money and money and you never finish to spend money. They kept talking. Juan Padilla said, look, I have money to invest. You're a master yogurt maker. Together we can do this. Edgar says they talked about ownership, agreed that Juan would own most of the company. Edgar would own about a quarter. He went to Deanna, asked her what she thought. You think we should start again? And I said, oh my goodness, again? Because behind that first question was another one. Are you going to support me again? That's what he asked me. Because I have to like work double to cover for certain time with all the expenses in the house while he start to make money in there. For me, it's hard, but at the same time, it's like a challenge. Our producer, Bruce Wallace, had a question for her. And why did you say, go ahead? What made you say, even though I'm going to have to work double, go ahead and, and do this? Because he knows how to do it. That's the hard part. Found something that you can make that is good. We have that. We have that. The rest is put everything together and work. That seems to have been pretty much the idea behind this company. Edgar can make yogurt like nobody else. Hard work will take care of the rest. Juan wrote a check for $20,000 to get things going. Edgar threw himself into building a new yogurt plant. All the plan is designed for me. Even the walls. The walls is glass because I love the people see how we made it. We don't have nothing hiding. The people can see, oh, this guy doing like this. The building wasn't fancy, and most of the equipment was secondhand. But the factory was just the way he wanted it. There were temperature-controlled vats, stainless steel pipes, a walk-in cooler that Edgar called the cave. He feels so good about it. He feels so good about it. Diana says when people commented on the yogurt, Edgar was proud to say, I'm the owner. 
I made it. I made the company. And who designed this? I made the design. And the, this machine? Oh, I made that machine. And the formula, the recipe, is mine. Edgar decided to use organic milk. That would set their yogurt apart from others, he thought. And there were lots of others. This was the time when Greek yogurt and fancier yogurts were starting to take over the dairy aisle. There was Chobani, Faye, lots of little boutique brands. Edgar came up with a name for his company, Three Happy Cows, and he tried it out on a group of friends. They all laughed. That was it, Three Happy Cows. He took his new yogurt around Dallas to talk to potential customers. He'd set up in a shop, give out samples, talk about what he was making. For one week, I went every single day and be in the store. I know the customer. You come in and you, hey, Edgar, hi, hi, how you do? How is the yogurt today? Oh, it's good. And after a week, I know so many customers. It's creating a relation with the people. Diana didn't take a job with the company. She told Edgar she didn't want them to put all their eggs in the same basket. But she had her own window into the life of his customers. She cleaned the houses of some of them. And as she did, she watched for clues to what those people liked. She looked at Edgar's labels and she thought, those labels look cheap. And he said, mm -mm, I don't see those kind of labels in those refrigerators and I clean in there. Improve that label. Or oh, they think of what they have for breakfast. Oh, those families have this and this and this for breakfast. They don't have this, 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 this. And I say to him, Edgar, just less sugar or less calories because, you know, they always want to be in shape. That was my help. The company started in 2010. In 2011, it sold $70,000 worth of yogurt. The next year, they sold five times as much. Their biggest customers were high-end stores around Texas. They were working on a deal with Whole Foods. And Edgar was proud of that. But he was even more proud of the reputation his yogurt was getting. It won Best Drinkable Yogurt at a national competition in 2010. And he took home prizes again the next two years. For a tiny yogurt company that was basically riding on one man's obsession and the bank account of Juan Padilla, who was a newcomer in the food business, this felt like incredible success. About two years into its life, though, Three Happy Cows ran into the problem that a lot of new businesses face. It was growing, but it wasn't turning a profit. In this case, the company was tens of thousands of dollars behind in paying one of its milk suppliers. And Juan Padilla, the company's sole financial backer, was running out of cash and patience. If it was going to survive, Three Happy Cows needed investors with deeper pockets, people willing to put a million dollars into the company, probably more. In January 2013, new investors did arrive. Three Dallas businessmen with experience in food and restaurants. One of them, Stephen White, was a customer. That's how Edgar knew him. Their interest was a huge vote of confidence. But the arrival of the investors revealed another potentially more troubling problem. It wasn't actually clear who owned the company. Edgar says he and Juan had agreed to be co-owners, but that's not how the company was set up. There are documents that seem to support Edgar's version of the story. For example, we have a copy of the Articles of Organization for Three Happy Cows. This is basically the document that creates the company. It's from early 2010. A draft lists Juan Padilla and Edgar Diaz as partners. But someone has crossed out Edgar's name. In the version that Juan Padilla filed a few weeks later, he is listed as the company's sole owner. And when the investors came on the scene more than two years later, Edgar pushed Juan to get this ownership question resolved. He wrote Juan a note laying out what he thought was their current agreement. Things had shifted a bit. Now it was 80% of the company for Juan and his wife, 20% for Edgar. Juan signed the note, said he agreed with this, but nothing changed. Edgar was increasingly frustrated with his partner, but he didn't tell Deanna what was going on. Did he ever talk about this question of how much of the company he did own? No, that was the mistake to me. He hides everything because he don't want to make me worry. He hides all those problems with money and all that kind of stuff because he knows I will probably make him take different decisions. Like, wait a minute, what are you doing with this? He has a dream and he tried to do whatever it takes to make that company keep going. Edgar says he can pinpoint the moment, late one night, at the office, when he really stopped trusting Juan Padilla. It was in January 2013. In the night, I found the papers. 
two sets of papers, two contracts. In the first one, Juan Padilla turned over management of the company to the new investors. The second one outlined a deal in which Juan would sell the company to them at some point in the future for $1.3 million. And Edgar realized none of that money would go to him. Edgar confronted Juan. And I asked him, Juan, do you sell the company? Tell me the truth. No, no, never. I'm very pissed off. I say, okay. Edgar felt like Juan was lying to him. True, Juan hadn't sold the company yet. But the documents showed he did plan to. And the potential buyers were already managing the company, making changes, cutting costs. They cut the organic milk. They cut quality control. They cut the hour of the employees. They destroy everything we do in three months. I have to be clear. There are documents that support parts of Edgar's story, but some other parts we can't verify. And Juan Padilla and other former partners won't talk on the record. I left messages for Juan. The only response I got was a text message. It reads, quote, So painful. I don't want to talk about it. I don't know where you got my cell phone, and I don't care, but please delete it. I sent him a list of questions by mail, but never heard back. I do have a copy of an email exchange between Juan and Edgar from those months when things were getting bad between them. It's translated from Spanish. In it, Juan spells out just how much Three Happy Cows cost him when he was the only investor. As you know, I was losing 20000 every two weeks, he writes, just with the promise that someday we would reach a point of equilibrium. We never arrived. Juan is optimistic about the new investors, writing, quote, We are going to work with them and see what the future brings. I have faith that the future will be great, but only God knows. One of the Dallas businessmen agreed to talk with me briefly off mic. His name is Blaine Eiler. He told me he signed non-disclosure agreements that prevent him from talking about many parts of the Three Happy Cows story. But he wanted me to know a couple of things. Edgar Diaz made an incredible product, he told me. But that's the only thing he did well. He didn't know the most basic business information, like how much it actually cost to make his yogurt. He told me they weren't destroying Three Happy Cows, they were turning it around. Blaine Eiler also said that Edgar didn't know it, but he and his partners were prepared to make Edgar part owner of the new company. After discovering those two contracts, though, all Edgar could think about was how he was losing control of the company that he thought was his. Now he hated going to work at that company, taking orders from people he felt didn't respect him. He was frustrated, angry, increasingly paranoid. He tightened his grip on the things he could control, like that yogurt-making process. Even though he'd taken pride in the windows that let people see how yogurt was made, he now tried to keep the details secret. That knowledge was the source of his power. He says one of the new investors came to him and asked for the formulas to make the company's yogurt. And I say, why do you want the formulas? And he say, we bought the company. I say, okay, who is the seller? He say, Juan. I say, my name is not Juan. Call a Juan and ask him Juan for the formulas. You don't have to talk with me. The investors offered Edgar a new deal, an employment contract. And they start bringing me contracts. Sort of like this? Let me see. Oh, yes. Yes. I have a copy of one of these contracts, retrieved from the files at Three Happy Cows. And there's a handwritten note on the top left-hand corner of the first page. A single word in big block letters. No. With an exclamation point. Did you write this? Yes. Yes. Can you remember the time when you looked at this document and scrawled no exclamation point on it? Yeah. You sit down in a Starbucks, my favorite place, for this take decisions. See, I read it and I say... Come on, I can work for nobody, and they offer me part of the profit. It's not the company, it's of the profit. This doesn't include any ownership? No. If you read it, they offer to you, I think, 25% of the profit. What happens if the company is not profit? You don't have nothing. Actually, the version we got a copy of doesn't include a share of the profit. It just lays out Edgar's salary as an employee, $60,000. Edgar didn't sign it, but he didn't leave either. He kept working, making yogurt. Diana knew by this time what was going on at the company. 
And she could see Edgar was falling apart inside. Edgar doesn't smile anymore. Edgar was like depressed, so depressed. Like he doesn't want to come home. He lose weight. He was going cuckoo. <laughs> um, because this guy started to take Edgar's position away. A lot of people in Edgar's position might have walked away. Diana says he just couldn't. This was his life. This is mine. I, I don't want to leave it. You know, it's like you write a half of the story and or somebody else say, let me just finish for you. Just, no, wait, that's mine. I want to finish it. I start that. That was my idea. It's hard. And it's not the first time. It was the third time it's going to happen. He feels like uh, he's going to fail for me. You know, he's going to fail for the family. I just think it's like he was just like saying, oh, my God, I did it again. How am I going to tell Diana? We're going to have to start from zero. The last of the contracts that the new investors offered to Edgar for him to sign is dated March 15, 2013. It was a Friday. And on that day, the investors were excited, optimistic. They thought that Three Happy Cows was about to break through. They'd received a big order from an upscale chain of grocery stores called Central Market, the biggest order ever. They told Edgar, if we can do this, it'll open lots of doors. They challenged me with... You can make 5,000 Greek yogurt. We have an order for 5,000 Greek yogurt. That's the end. If we do this one, we have all the deals. Edgar worked through the weekend on March 16 and 17 to finish the job. In the middle of the night, Sunday night, he drove his sister-in-law to the airport. And on the way back, he stopped at the factory to see if the yogurt was done. And I come in into the factory to see if I have the product. I went into the cave, the walking cooler, and opened the tanks. I tested, and when I saw it, when I moved it and smell it, I said, yes. And I jumped in very happy, say, man, I made it, I made it, I know I made it. But second later, and I saw all the cases and everything ready for delivery, I start thinking, I make a mistake. As he scanned the biggest batch of yogurt Three Happy Cows had ever produced, this is what Edgar says it dawned on him. I gave up my secret. To make a batch this big, he needed to bring in more people. And he starts thinking, all those people, I show them how to do what I do. It's not just a matter of formulas. This much milk, this much bacteria, combine them at this temperature. It's a matter of watching the process, reacting to it. That is the secret. Nobody has a trademark on the yogurt. But your yogurt and my yogurt is different. It's how we made it. They know how I did it. Everybody saw it. They don't need me. He was thinking, probably not too clearly, that he'd lost the one thing he still controlled at the company, the part of the business that he cared about more than anything, the craft of it. And nobody had forced him to hand over that knowledge. He'd done it all by himself. Edgar says that's when he cracked. The first thing I tried to think is how you can kill yourself. I have some gasoline we use for cleaning the equipment. I saw the, the gasoline and I said, okay, I want to die with this one. I burn with this place. I burn with this place, he says. He started pouring gasoline here, there. Arson investigators looking at the scene later said fires were started in at least six different places. And I dump in and I set up. He set the fire. And he says then he laid down on the floor thinking he'd die there. But when he heard the sound of the fire, smelled the smoke, he couldn't go through with it. When I saw the fire, I was terrified and I ran it. He ran to his car, and he drove home. In the morning, I received the call from Juan. I went to the place, and I can't believe the damage I made. Man. All the place is dark and filled up with water. The walls is it's completely black. I, I don't know what I did. It. I feel... Destroy. Blaine Eiler, the investor, was there that morning. 
He remembers Edgar just walking around sobbing. It never occurred to him that Edgar had started the fire. And I left the place and I went to a lake and I spent almost all the day sit down thinking what I did it. I remember I received a call from Diana and she asked me, what are you? And I tell and say, no, I'm, I'm thinking right now. He didn't tell Diana what he'd done. He told investigators that he was at home when the fire happened. But over the next few months, they zeroed in on him. They administered a polygraph. Edgar failed three times. That's when he admitted it was him. If I tell you the truth, after I tell the police, I feel better. And then I go in and I tell Diana, I say, Diana, you know, I did it, I did it. I say I did it. She say, are you sure? I say, yeah. Coming up, what happens to you, your family, and your business after you've burned everything down? That's after these words from our sponsors. This episode of Startup is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easy to build a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. But building a website, it wasn't always this easy or this fast. Remember this sound? Brings you back, doesn't it? Dial up internet service. The reason why it sounded so weird is that you were connecting through the phone line. And the thing about a phone line is that they're built for the human voice. They're not built to handle digital information. So when you connected to the internet, all that digital information had to translate itself into frequencies that an analog system like a phone line could understand. So think of this sound as digital information trying to speak. It's poetic, really. The internet has come a long way, and these days, building a website is easier than ever thanks to Squarespace. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Welcome back to Startup. I'm Lisa Chow. Before the break, we were telling the story of Edgar Diaz. He'd built a factory in Dallas to practice the craft he loved, making yogurt. Then he burned that factory down. Dan Charles continues our story. Edgar's crime wrecked more than a yogurt factory. It threw his family into turmoil, blew up their finances, left their future uncertain. After the fire, Edgar was in limbo for more than a year and a half, waiting to hear his sentence. He was diagnosed with depression, started taking medication. In the meantime, the three Dallas businessmen closed their deal with Juan Padilla. They bought three happy cows and started making the yogurt at another company's factory. And then, only a few months into their ownership, they turned around and sold the company to an industry giant, Tyson Foods. Edgar's lawyer says if the investors had actually made Edgar a part owner, he would have pocketed something like $300,000 from that sale. A year and a half later, Tyson shut down three happy cows. And that same month, January 2015, Edgar Diaz was sentenced to five years in prison. Michelle, hágale pues. Right here. It's a Friday a few months back. I meet Diana and her younger daughter, Michelle, on their way out the door to visit Edgar in prison. Friday is the one day each week when Diana now gets to see her husband and Michelle gets to see her father. This is my typical Friday. I left Michelle's school around 7.45, straight to work, pick Michelle at 3.15. We have lunch, like, really quick. What happened? We're heading yeah. southeast from Dallas toward the tiny town of Segoville, toward the biggest thing in Segoville, the federal prison. Michelle's sitting in the back seat. She's nine years old. When Diana prompts her to explain the routine for visiting her father, she could be describing the dress code at a strict private school. Yeah, Michelle, do you know some rules? Do you know what, what you need to wear? Yeah, um, actually, there's this rule, like, for 10 and up, you have to wear sleeves that cover your shoulders. You can't wear leggings, but pants that can't be khaki, that have to go over your knee, which is insane. <laughs> Insane, especially when it's summer. Michelle's clutching two stuffed animals, handmade. 
my, my dad made these. One of them is a bear holding a heart, and then another is a dragon holding a heart as well. The dragon's name is Dragonil. Um, my dad named it, not me. From the front seat, Deanna asks, Dragon what does Dragonil do? He gives me love. He love. protects me from bullies. ¿Qué es eso, Michelle? What is bully? A bully. It's someone who picks on another person. Deanna explains, when you have a dad in jail, you get bullied a lot. We get to the prison a little after five. There's a line outside the front gate. Michelle, mira. ¿Qué What? What? Ah! Crap. Michelle. Sorry. But actually, the line doesn't look too long today. Sometimes they have to wait outside for an hour or more. When it's raining hard, sometimes they cancel visiting hours altogether. While Deanna parks the car, she sends Michelle ahead to find the last person in line and grab the spot behind them. Which way should I go off? Uh, that way. Okay. Remember they ask, who is the last person, okay? Okay, they're going in already. Yeah, yeah. Remember they ask, who is the last person? Seeing her husband go off to prison was a complete shock for Diana. And when they took Edgar, it's like he died. I know that was coming. Edgar is going to jail. But you never be prepared. You never. Edgar left her with tens of thousands of dollars of credit card debt. He'd used her cards to buy supplies for three happy cows. She had to declare bankruptcy. Her credit was destroyed. Another thing hanging over them, the judge has ordered Edgar to pay $1.5 million to insurance companies for the damage the fire caused. He's supposed to start making payments after he gets out of prison. Stuck with all this, Deanna has dropped her plans to go back to school to become a counselor. Instead, she's still cleaning houses. She's also trying to be there for two daughters. Michelle's at home, and Alejandro, who's 19 now, is off at college. The toughest thing, she says, has been trying to figure out what to say to them. That's hard for me. Explain to a nine years old why dad is not home. Explain a 19 years old how, how the daddy, the, the superhero, did that. And try to make her understand it was a mistake. He made a mistake. Still, most days, Diana can push aside thoughts about mistakes and failure. There's just no point dwelling on that. And she says there's also no point in getting angry at her husband. What can I get from if I get angry? What can I get from that? Like more hard time? He is still the father, and he was before, and he's still being an excellent father, an excellent husband and everything. He's still like that. How you can hate a person like that? I ask her if she wishes they'd never gotten involved in Three Happy Cows. She doesn't want to think about that. She wants to talk about what they can learn from it. The biggest lesson is stop asking you all the time, why, 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 why? That don't take you anywhere. It's not why happened, it's what is next. Okay, now I'm going to be more careful, now I'm going to be more smart, now I'm going to be this, now I'm going to be this. No, it's like, oh, from now I'm never going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do, no, do it again, but now do it right. And that raises a question. What would doing it right look like? One possible answer is back at Deanna and Edgar's home. It's a single-story brick house on a quiet block in Garland, an unpretentious suburb of Dallas. There's a room here in back of the house. It used to be an open-air porch. Now it's closed in. Here in the room, I see a stainless steel vessel almost as big as a person with precise temperature controls to heat milk. The walls of this room are made from special materials that can handle high humidity. Around the corner in the garage, there are half a dozen coolers. It's a miniature yogurt factory. After everything Edgar and Deanna have been through, after the FARC, failed partnerships, mental breakdowns, they'd be ready to give it another shot. Edgar built all this during that last year of limbo before he went to prison. It's going to be a good project, I know, for sure. And in prison, he's still working on his plan for this small-batch milk processing operation. He laid it out for me. He'd turn 1,200 gallons of milk a month into drinkable yogurt, butter, ice cream, sold by subscription to 650 families. He's put together a 12-page business plan. The final page estimates profits of around $50,000 a year. And I start thinking, okay, you made $50,000 a year. 
you can live very well. You are not the rich people in the world, but you live well. The idea is keep it small, simple, high quality. Don't grow. And one other thing. My new plan is have only one partner, Diana. <laughs> but at the end of our interview, as we're standing out in the prison yard waiting for a guard to come and escort Edgar back to the compound where he lives, he mentioned something else. A few days ago, he got a letter from the owner of a dairy that used to supply three happy cows with organic milk. Some investors are interested in giving the dairy money to start making yogurt. And the letter asked, would Edgar be interested in working with them? He could even start now, advising them on what equipment to buy. They told me they have 2,400 cows for milking. It's a lot of milk. 2,400 cows. It's a lot of milk, Edgar tells me. Yeah, okay, thank you. Taking off. Thank you. Thank you so much. When Edgar mentioned this to us, it seemed just like an afterthought. The next day, though, was Deanna and Michelle's weekly visit. And by then, apparently, the possibilities in that letter were growing in Edgar's mind. I rode back home with Deanna and Michelle after their visit. And Deanna told me they'd spent much of their time listening to Edgar talk about it. I just asked one question. What do you think about the letter? And he makes this long conversation, like 40 or 50 minutes, not stopping, about what he can do with that. The project never stopped. He's thinking about what he could do with this dairy operation. I just let him talk, you know, like dream about it. Like nothing of that is for real. It's just like, like thinking aloud, I guess. He's dreaming. He's dreaming already. And with this letter, make him like dream more. There are some real problems with both of the futures that Edgar is spinning out in his mind. The home yogurt plant might end up taking years of work and never make much money. The big 2,400 cow dairy, that puts him back in the world of partners and investors and difficult compromises. And that's a tough place for someone who admits he makes decisions with his heart more than his head. Edgar won't walk out of the Segoville prison for another three years. So these two visions, Deanna's right, they're not real. But they're real enough, they give Edgar something to focus on. He can't do the thing he loves right now. He can't mix the milk and the bacteria, tap the container to see if the yogurt is set just right. But imagining it, planning for a time when he can do it again, it gives him something to hold on to. Dan Charles covers food and agriculture for NPR. If you like today's show, you should check out all the other stories that Dan and his colleagues are digging up in the world of food. You can find them by visiting NPR's food blog, The Salt. Coming up, we'll have scenes from the next episode of Startup, after these words from our sponsors. In next week's episode of Startup, when you're running a struggling business and doing everything you can to keep it alive, sometimes the things that hurt the company are completely out of your control. You as a business owner had nothing to do with it. You, you didn't play a role in it. You, you know, your business didn't play a role in it. It just happens. But it comes up anytime somebody said, oh, is this a place where uh, that guy got murdered? We'll take a look at a business address with a troubled history. That's coming up next week. One last thing, Reply All, another Gimlet show, is looking to hire a fall intern. So if you're aching to make great stories and want to join a creative, hardworking team, you should apply. The deadline is July 13th. You can find out more by visiting their website at replyall.soy. Today's episode of Startup was produced by Bruce Wallace. It was edited by Alex Bloomberg, Peter Clowney, Molly Messick, Caitlin Roberts, Luke Malone, and Simone Polanin. Thanks to Mark Gilman for his help with the episode. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Build Buildings wrote and performed our special ad music. Additional music from Kevin Sparks, Talkstar, Tyler Strickland, Ampline, Marley Carroll, and the band HotMoms.gov. Matthew Bowl mixed the episode. To subscribe to the podcast, go to iTunes or check out the Gimlet Media website, gimletmedia.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Podcast Startup. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to build a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. 
Remember to use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful.